Hello and welcome to the ICLIF Leadership and Governance Centre's Leaders Room. Today with us is Helen Reed. Helen Reed is the founder of Miss Reed Fashion Brand, which designs and sells women's plus size clothes in boutiques throughout Malaysia. A homemaker turned entrepreneur, she has started four companies such as Q Corporation in 1979 and Miss Reed in 1997, which together will generate more than 25 million ringgits in revenue this year and provide jobs for over 200 people. Among the businesses set up by Miss Reed are familiar names such as Delicious, the Miss Reed Shops, Dude and Duchess, and the Big Group, which is now run by her son, Benjamin Yong. Welcome to the Leaders' Room, Helen. Helen, when you were growing up in Ipoh, mm. you were leading a life that many would call very privileged, being chauffeured around in cars and living in bungalows with swimming pools. Now, with the life that seemed to be set uh, uh, for you, what made you into an entrepreneur? Well, that was uh, by chance. After I got married, um, I met a friend who was uh, wanting to start a business manufacturing clothes and she was short of 9,000. So she said, Helen, can you lend me the money? So I did. And she, out of a kind soul, gave me shares in return. And uh, that was for Q Corporation, a manufacturing company which I still own till today. And um, what happened was, a couple of years later, when my marriage broke down, Q Corporation became my lifeline for, to support me, uh, you know, give me an income. And so, in a way, that's how I went into business. You didn't have any formal uh, training, you know, in finance or accounting or law or any such thing. But what was that spark that actually said that, hey, I'm actually quite good at this? Well, that was many years down the road. <laughs> All the t when I first started, it was like, oh, it was paying everybody else and paying myself last, you know. Most probably, some, most months I had only about $400 for myself. But um, I never knew that I was doing a business. It was really just every day going to work to make clothes for all these department stores that place orders and uh, providing an income for the people that work together with me. At that time, it was just nine of us. And, uh, and one day it grew into a big business. <laughs> so how, uh, what, what was it that kept you going then in that sense? So uh, I had, there was one uh, discipline I really had to learn because in the early days as a single mother, when I finish work, I have a lot of problems. Rather than take it home with me, I had this physical exercise. As I leave the office and shut the door, all my problems are locked in the room. And then I go back to my family and my, I don't think about my work. And everything is at home. And I, you know, work problems, I mean, uh, home problems, whatever it is, when I leave the home in the morning, it remains at home and I go to work. So in a way, I have learned to separate that life so well that now the children all have this standing joke that mom cannot think without her shoes on. Because when I'm at home, I don't think about work at all. And so when they talk to me about work, I just say, ah, can't we talk about that tomorrow? I can't think with my shoe, without my sh shoes on. So it is a standing joke at home. <laughs> Is this, um, is this a, a, an advice you would give to a lot of our modern uh, ladies who are trying to, 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 to juggle between you know, mm. home and life and career? Yes. What, what, what are some of the lessons that you could impart on, on those ladies? I think that when we are with our children, we really have to enjoy them because the time goes so fast. You know, before you know it, like Benjamin is 37, you know, and time has gone by so fast. So when they're young, you're only there for that moment. You better enjoy them because one day they've all grown up. <laughs> so how do you separate it where you said you just close the door and yes. everything's left behind? Yes. But in this modern world where you're constantly connected, mm. how do you close the door? Well, at home, I don't open my laptop. I mean, like now the children are all grown up because my time is my own. Uh, they all left the nest. <laughs> I mean, so well, when I watch TV, I will have my laptop on because you know sometimes programs are a bit slow the shows are a bit slow so I'm, I'm doing two things at the same time <laughs> so yeah I mean I think you each one has to work out a system for themselves there's no hard and fast rule there's no right or wrong way because if you're somebody who loves to be on to be connected and asks you to do that is a real punishment <laughs> to sort of shut off your phone shut off your emails 
just to spend time with children. So you have to devise a way, you know. You mentioned earlier on that um, it, that um, your cooperation was the lifeline after the breakdown of your first marriage, and also there was a financial crisis that was threatening foreclosure of your company. <coughs> mm. Now, in most circumstances, most people would have crumbled. Mm. How did you manage to just maintain it and mm. keep the cost? Well, the thing was that was in the early 80s when I experienced my first uh, recession. That was uh, really a really bad one. Where you remember, I don't know whether you were born yet, but the Emporium groups were all, all closed and, uh, and eventually converted to Parkson Group. But a lot of the businesses shut down and I had a lot of uh, businesses with Emporium Group. So I almost shut down with them. But I don't know. That's why I think uh, within each of us, we have a strength uh, that sometimes during difficult times like that, you you are pushed to that limit and you you just go on. And and so that's what happens uh, happened to me because I had to write to the bank because the bank was threatening foreclosure. You know, I had a, the emperor owed me 200 and I owed the bank about 200,000 at that time. And so they threatened foreclosure. So what I did was I wrote a letter to them asking them to give me a chance because what forced me to do that was because I was thinking of all these people that worked together with me in the factory. They will all be without jobs and you know, and a lot of them, the women, were main income owners. You know. So I always think of my role as providing a rice bowl for all these families. And so I think that was that, that, that push that I needed and to write to the bank. Because those days, I am so timid. You ask me to talk to a banker, I would say, oh, I'd rather do something else. But it forced me to do that and wrote the letter. And I must say, uh, that's why sometimes I really admire uh, our Malaysian banks because they have that, that kindness. And so they said yes. They gave me one year with 12 post-dated checks to repay the loan and we continued. Of course, at that time, to make that payment for the 12, each check that came every month was very tough. But, you know, the Lord helped us with all that because that's why I have this strong belief that God helps us. And I'm never, I'm never so clever or so great that I can do without him. Yeah. What's the role of belief or even you know strength in spirituality and faith mm. in 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 a path or in in contributing to the path of success for any person? I believe um, our relationship with God is everything. It governs our us completely in our lives as like for me as a mother at home as a, a boss at work as a friend among my friends and so with God in our lives everything becomes very simple you know there's no uh, airs about anything because when it really comes to down to it is how God guides us how he leads us to be better people, to make an impact on the community he put us in. Like in my work, I always call my work area a community. We are working together to do better, to provide lovely clothes for our customers. You know, I mean, you think of a garment. You think it's just a garment hanging on a hanger, but it has gone through so many processes. At least 15 people have touched it and to get it on its way. Our team of designers are full of creativity. And if you, th I mean, how would something, uh, a garment come out so beautifully done? So it's all the people involved, but of course, to get the right people involved, you know, because my, I, somebody recently asked me, what's your most challenging role in your business? I said, finding the right person for the right job. Because when they are happy in that job, they really do very well. Like my head designer, she does so well because she really enjoys designing. And so that's one of the biggest challenges. So when I want to interview, I always say a prayer, God, bring me the right person. And that's how we have a really strong team and a young team, because as I face myself out, I, the company is ready with this young team. In your statements, mm. words like kindness, mm. um, you know, community, mm. altruism, it's peppered throughout your, all of your words. Mm. What is this role of this softer, nicer aspect in a modern business nowadays? Because it's, nowadays it's all about cutthroat and mm. it's all about just getting to the top uh, and taking no prisoners. Mm. What's your thoughts on that? 
maybe this is why I'm not such a good business. I'm not a business person. I'm not shrewd enough. I'm not clever enough, and I'm not sharp enough. But anyway, <laughs> the thing is, I I plod along, and my team plods along with me, and I think. Because I always see my role as building people. You know, the people who come to me, a lot of times they are broken. And so when they normally start the job with me, it's really tough because they, they, they don't trust me and they think I'm out to get something from them and all that. So when they come, a lot of times it's that moulding and in a way uh, teaching them it's safe to be here, it's safe to be yourself, you know, because none of us are perfect. And sometimes your weakness becomes a strength in that team. You know, like one of the one of uh, our young designers joined us a few years ago, and she always had this uh, what's the word? She was insecurity. She always felt she was not good at the job, and she she would always apologize. Until one day, I I said, "You stop apologizing." stop this and I talked to her about her talents her strength how she combines those colors and and every day I enjoy watching her when she comes to work her clothes what she wears how she combines it inspires me and I tell you after that she never apologized and she speaks out so that's what I I see my role as molding people like yeah I'm a mother like Abby calls me mother <laughs> And I, that's the role I really love. I really am grateful to God for the role of being a mother. Is that how you would describe your leadership style? Nurturing and, and the role of being a mother figure in that sense? Yes, but I won't let anyone call me mother. <laughs> Except Abby and my children. But anyway, they all do that. In fact, we have a group of deaf and dumb uh, people. I don't know what's the politically correct word, but I call them as it is. And, and uh, they always call me this. They call me this, which means like mother with a bum, a uh, bun in the bum. Sorry, <laughs> mother with a bun. So that's how they describe because they they can't speak. Uh, and so yeah, I, I know behind my back, uh, all my staff call me mother. Um, uh, in Chinese they call ama ama lelo or mother's coming. You know, so yeah, I, I I like it. I yeah. In fact, a lot of my children's friends come and they call they tell me they are my adopted children which makes it lovely for me yeah uh, years ago i watched a movie the joy luck club and there was one part in the movie that really touched my heart to see the mother the aunties cooking together with the in the kitchen they were and the young girls and, and they were chatting so recently when we were doing this uh, photo shoot for at uh, our new cookbook there was a moment when i observed and i saw Abby, myself, and these two young girls, these friends of my daughter, in the kitchen, they were all helping us, and I was telling Abby, this is a joy luck club moment. How wonderful is this? And yeah, so that's what I enjoy. I enjoy interacting with different ones, different ages, and uh, I don't just mix with people of my age. And yeah, so. It's interesting that you've been describing your family as, uh, your, your company as, I, even I said it, your mm. company as a family, mm. like with you as the, the, the matriarch in that mm. sense. There are a lot of benefits to that, but also there are some um, uh, proponents where people say, working in a family company, there's just no way for us to get to the top. Mm. Because you know, the top positions are always reserved for the family members. Mm. Uh, and in your case, your son, who's very, very, very uh, successful, and also your, your, your close friend, Abby. Mm. What's your thoughts on that about family-run companies? Mm. Family is family, and when they're in the office, they are part of a team. And remember how I can lock my problems in the office when I leave? The same thing, I can do the same at the office. I somehow have this ability, God-given, that I don't see them as my daughter, or because my second son is also in the business. He does the graphic designs for for all the our magazines. I don't see them as uh, my son or my daughter. I see them as part of this team, and so when they don't perform, or they will still get that, you know, uh, chiding. Um, and I've also assured the some of my senior staff that if they can't perform. They will also have. To, they would have to leave, but if they continue to perform, why not? They were born into my family, and for me, I have a successor. 
you know, I have this, you know, they always say you must plan succession. And I think that's very, very important. I can't leave the company suddenly without a leader. And so this, uh, this period, my daughter's joined me two years. My son has been, my second son, Benedict, has been with me four years. And so it, it, I'm there overseeing them and making sure, and they are allowed to make mistakes. It's not that they have this pressure that they can't, because I made those mistakes when I started the company. And so they are allowed to, but it's enjoyable to sit beside and watch them grow and watch them flourish and to tell me they really love their job. So, um, yeah, so there's, there's also a possibility that they may not leave the company one day. What are the pitfalls that you would, um, you know, your advice uh, other uh, people in your situation leading family-owned companies to, to, to avoid, you know, or at least, you know, which would raise the red alarm? Family members must be treated as team members. They don't get any extra privileges. They work as a team. I think the importance, I mean, like for me, is to treat them as individuals. Because I also not, do not assume, because they're my children, that I can just force them to work till 10 o'clock, 12 o'clock at night, or to give unreasonable demands. I treat them the same way as I treat every member of my team. I don't send out instructions after six. We don't have meetings at five. We finish on the dot at six, and my children are expected to finish at six too. Everybody finishes at six because I believe that everyone must be in, go home in time to see their children, spend some time, have dinner with them. And so, for years, in fact, recently we had a new girl join our, our team and she used to work till nine, ten o'clock every night. So when she, we said, you have to leave, six o'clock, they're shutting the doors. She was shocked. She said, oh, what am I going to do at the time? When she, and she told us the next day, when she got home, her daughter was asking her, Mom, why are you home so early? You know, so for me, when she told me that, I was saying, yeah, this is the right way. This is the right way because children need to see their mothers. Most organizations find it very difficult to sort of uh, align all of their employees towards a common purpose and a common passion. Mm. What more when dealing with your own children? How do you go about um, having that one point of focus where everybody can, can, can steer towards? Because it's always about the business. It's always about mystery. It's always about dude and duchess. It's not about uh, whether Benedict can do this or not, whether Christy or whether who feels like doing what. It's always about the business and it's always about everybody in the business. We have to care for everybody because when one of us makes a mistake, everybody suffers. And so that's the focus. It's always about the business. It's not about whether uh, how good you are, how not good you are. It, it's not because I always feel with all our flaws and everything and our talents, we put them together, they become the team behind misery. We think a lot, we discuss a lot, we have a lot of um, meetings uh, every week, once a week, we have our HOD meetings where we will share ideas and, and trash out. And because they have been with me for a long time, people dare to speak up. And when they don't speak up that much, I will pose them questions <laughs> and ask what they think. And credit to them, they always have an answer. <laughs> so, yeah. You have described yourself, if, and if I may summarize, it's like an accidental leader. Mm. What do you think about, do you believe that leaders are born or, uh, or made? I don't think anyone's born anything. I mean, we are come out, come into the world as babies and we absorb our environment and yet we can change because born in an environment where, you know, I had lots of privileges and lots of love and care and having the opportunity to study overseas, the environment makes you in a way uh, because as I said, when I first started business, I'm timid, I'm, I'm gentle, I don't know anything much but when that problem came and I rose to that occasion, I had to make that, uh, write that letter, it changed me. And in a way, I, be, I never became scared of bankers. When I went for meetings with them and they said, oh, Helen, you need to diversify. I would say to, the face, to their face, diversify to what? This is all I know, how to make clothes. 
You want me to do land deals, develop houses? I don't know. I, this, all my money goes into this business. And so, yeah, so I've had some uh, good talks with different ones because I've overcome that fear. So it is about facing your fear and just going through with it. Mm, just do it. Like when I became a single mother and I was invited for uh, cocktails, events, fashion shows and all. It's easier to say, ah, I'm not free, I want to just stay at home. But I forced myself because I was so timid and shy. I said, no, nope, I will go. And you know how difficult it is to stand in a place with a drink and nobody's come to speak to you? Do you know how difficult it is? It's very, very difficult. But I forced myself to do it time and again, time and again, until I felt, all right, I've learned this enough. I can do this. That's why I learned to eat in restaurants alone. I learned to do a lot of things alone. Even to this day, some days, I will just take the day off and wander in the malls alone because it makes me see things better, makes me um, observe. And as I'm observing, I'm also processing and thinking. So it's, I've overcome that. What's your advice for some of those people who are facing their fears at this point of time? How would they be able to find the strength to, to go past that? Well, it depends how determined you are. Because some fears don't need to be faced. You know, I'm scared of ghosts, but I'm not going to go into a haunted house <laughs> to just face the fears, you know. But, you know, what happens is I pray. You know, I go into a hotel room, I don't know what's there or whatever. I pray before I go into the room. I ask God to help me, you know, to protect me. So everywhere I go when I'm fearful or anything, I ask the Lord to help me. And so that's why a lot of times we can overcome that fear. Because when you're walking alongside and you know, walking along and you know God is with you, it, you become brave. Yes. You, I would term that you are very lucky to have found your passion in cooking mm. and also in fashion and mm. have been able to successfully transform that into, into, a, into a very successful business. Now, how would you advise people to find their passion and to recognize it and, and, to, and to do something with it? Mm. A, a lot of times, it comes right down to a simple thought. It has to, you have to be very honest with yourself. What do you like? What is life giving? When you go to work, what makes you excited about going to work? Because I've been in the business for 34 years and I can say I'm excited to go to work every day. I don't know what's in store for me every day and I, that's how exciting it is to go to work. Of course, I know some meetings are, are already arranged. But the thing is, I don't know how the meetings will turn out. So the th important thing is to be honest with yourself. What do you like? What's life sapping? What's life sapping which you really don't like? You got to get rid of that. Uh, of course, like for me, there are some things I have to do that are life sapping. And but because I do so much life giving, that life sapping one, two things I can live with because I have, yeah, I do a lot of things that I love. So does that answer the question? Yes. <laughs> As a leader, uh, and as a mother leader, mm -hmm. if that's a well, I coined a new yes, word. I think a mother you leader. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> your 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 employees and your team actually derive a lot of their energy uh, from you. Mm. So they they actually uh, derive that from you. How do you keep yourself, you know, your 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 gas tank filled in order for you to keep on giving out that energy to to your whole team? Well, to be honest with you, Zachary, I don't give my uh, team members energy. I'm not responsible for them uh, in that way. I energize myself every day. Oh, you, you use that word, energize. I build myself every day because I spend time with God. I pray, I read the Bible, and I pray for all my team members. I pray for their families. I pray for sometimes their prayer needs that are given to me. I pray for those. I pray also for my own family. And I pray for our business. I pray for our customers. You know, because, you know, when I go to a shop and I, and I see a customer buy things, like yesterday I was at Pavilion, and I saw this, um, one of my old customers walk in, and she said, I'm going to London for a holiday. And I wasn't there for a long time, but when, after I left in the afternoon, my, my staff texted me and said, oh, she bought 30 pieces, you know. That's so exciting. So I pay, pray for my customers that they really continue to enjoy uh, the clothes they buy and the food they eat. And 
So that's how I keep energy going. And not only that, it brings me down to earth. It's really very simple needs, all of us. You know, all of us have very simple needs. And if that's fulfilled, we become happy people. So when I walk into my office, I'm not bumbling with excitement or anything. I just walk into my office very calmly. And, and when we have meetings, everybody's energetic. Everybody contributes to a topic, especially when I give them a challenging uh, question. <laughs> It's a bit counterintuitive when you mention mm. that uh, um, that you don't. That's not your responsibility to give energy or to, mm. to, to your to your team members. Mm. Then what is the role of a leader in your in your thoughts? To be watchful. We what I well I watch I watch the business, I watch the people, because um, every other day my factory is just down the road from my office. I walk to the factory. I spend time, easily an hour or two, with among my uh, factory workers, and I watchful. What's the interlining? You know, the interlining that's inside your jacket. Uh, what what interlining are you using? We have people who take charge of that, who order because different fabrics use different interlining, and I just hang around the factory and watch. And well, I read a book many years ago about management style by walking. <laughs> so is that a way? I, so if you if you need if I have to think of a word it will be watchfulness. Did you ever think you would be a major influencer in the way Malaysians eat and dress? No, never believed that something like this could ever happen. But I did have a dream. I did have a dream one day well I think when Q Corporation was about two or three years old, and that's when I had bought over the company completely because my friend, her husband was transferred back to Ipoh, so she sold her shares to me as well. And so about three years into it, I owned the company completely by myself. And I was in Japan to buy fabrics, and I was in the restaurant by myself, and I had read this book, A Touch of Greatness by Frank Thibault. And inside that, it taught me to set goals, taught me to dream big dreams. So then I took out a piece of paper and I wrote. And I just wrote, wrote about my dreams, wrote about owning a label um, and the selling to all the shops. And, and here I am, what, having this business that carries my own label and I'm selling to many shops. I'm selling to Singapore, I have franchises. So the dream has come to pass. And I never believed it, it could happen, but I did write it down. And if you ask me where that paper was, I don't know where it is, because I like to write things down and I, I don't keep them. But somehow it's like, when I look at it after I've finished writing, it, it's nice to look at it and think about it. But I never read it again, a lot of things that I write. And yeah, and. Never believed, never dreamed that it would happen, but it did. That is why, again, we come back to God. God makes the impossible possible. What's next? What's next? Oh, so many things, so many possibilities. Of course, now the hot item is my cookbook. We're going to publish it. Hopefully, we'll launch it in November. Uh, we're having a collaboration with uh, Jonathan Liang, uh, he's a designer living in Paris for Dude and Duchess, so that will be launched end of October. So in the big picture, I don't know. In the big picture, I know everybody's in place to carry on the business if anything happens to me. So, but I don't know. Maybe I'll do a second book, cookbook. Yeah. With that, we wish you the very best of success and the very best of achieving your dreams, Helen. We thank you again for joining us in the Eclipse Leadership Room. Thank you. Thank you very much for being with us. This is Aliza Krialias from the Eclipse Leadership and Governance Centre signing off. Thank you.